that during most of your term in office you enjoyed the uh, almost united support of labor? Well, the labor men uh, were of the opinion that they had a man in the White House who wanted to be fair. And I think that's all the leaders want is fair treatment. And I tried to give it to them while I was in the Senate, while I was on the county court in Jackson County, and uh, after I became president. But I made it perfectly clear to them that I was a representative in each case of the people, and the people's welfare came first, but I wanted them to have fair treatment so far as their part of the situation is concerned. Do you think it was just as simple as that? That's all it was to it. That's all it was to it. Uh, Mr. President, why did you choose... Now, I had been the uh, commander of the Allied Forces in Europe. He knew all the heads of states, and he knew all the military commanders, and this organization, uh, I thought, was one of the most important we've ever had anything to do with, because the passage of that NATO bill reversed the foreign policy of the United States completely from isolationism to internationalism. And I thought that uh, General Eisenhower understood the situation as well as anybody that had ever had anything to do with it. And he was then president of the Columbia University, and I asked him if he uh, would be willing to take over the job, and he said he'd do anything in the world for the welfare of the country, and he took it, and did a good job of it. Is it true that you in fact So then conditions developed so that it was, uh, I felt, necessary to find someone who would... Uh, could be elected and who would carry on the policies which had been the policies of President Roosevelt and myself. So I asked uh, Senator Barclay to come and talk with me, Vice President Barclay, he was then, and uh, told him that if he would go to Chicago and arrange things uh, preliminary to the convention, and if, if my support would be of any good to him, I'd try my best to uh, see that he was nominated for the presidency in 1952. Well, the senator went to, the vice president, I should call him, went to Chicago and had a session with a bunch of labor leaders. He got all 16 of them together at once, and they turned him down as a candidate. And he called me on Monday of the week of the convention and told me that he had announced that he was going to withdraw, that he would not be a candidate. And I... Uh, suggested that he not do that, that he should stay in the race, but he insisted on withdrawing and told me that the only reason he called me was because he'd already given it to the newspapers. Well, around about Thursday, the governor of Illinois called me and told me, asked me if I would be embarrassed if uh, his friends nominated him for the presidency of the United States, and I blew up. I told him in uh, language that he could understand that I had been endeavoring in every way possible to get him to be the candidate, and that I, of course, would not be embarrassed if he were nominated. Well, he had the governor of Indiana to nominate him, and uh, the later on, when the convention was in the turmoil of the subject, I got in a plane and flew to Chicago and uh, uh, we succeeded in nominating him for President of the United States on the Democratic ticket. I had seen Barclay in the meantime, and he had made one of the most wonderful speeches on retirement from politics that any man ever made anywhere. It was a classic, and it will be considered that from the historians throughout the history of that period. But he allowed himself to be nominated again by uh, some of his friends, and I told him that I had told Stevenson that I would uh, try my best to have him nominated. And Stevenson was nominated that evening on the ballot that was then in progress when I arrived in Chicago. And uh, after he was nominated, we sat back under the stage with Sam Raymond and Frank McKinney and uh, Mr. Governor Stevenson and myself to discuss a vice president. 
and the discussion went on for a long, long time, and it was getting late, and I always liked to go to bed at a reasonable hour, so I finally got up and left, and it was agreed that uh, John Spuckman should be the nominee, and he was the nominee for vice president. But as soon as uh, uh, Dr. Stevenson became the uh, nominee of the Democratic Party, he immediately fired the chairman of the National Committee. Now, it's a most difficult thing to have an organization nationally uh, that will understand all that goes on in all the 48 states. And Mr. McKinney was one of the ablest chairmen we ever had, I think, in my recollection. And I can remember all the way back to 1908. My recollection, uh, Jim Farley and Frank McKinney were the best chairman uh, that the Democratic Party ever had. Well, uh, the governor of Illinois fired Frank McKinney as soon as he was nominated as pre for presidency, set up a headquarters in Springfield, Illinois, and carried on a sub-headquarters in Washington, which divided the uh, organization in such a way that uh, no one could say yes and no. Well, I was uh, disgusted with that arrangement, because I was a great friend of Frank McKinney's, and I was very much interested in electing a Democratic president after I left the office. And I had no idea of in any way having any control or any say in any man's administration because I had that same experience and I ran my own administration. I wanted the next man to do the same thing. Well, it worked out so that we lost that election by some six million votes. And I'm confident that if we could have maintained the organization that uh, that uh, victory of the Republicans would have been very much smaller. I think we lost three million votes by the arrangement that was carried out. Well, after the, uh, the fiasco was over and the uh, Republicans won the presidency and the Congress, then we began to think about the next go round, which would be in, a, in 1956. Well, in 1954, we uh, overwhelmingly elected the Democratic Congress. And I felt sure that we could elect a president in 1956 if we could get the thing properly organized. So I had several interviews with a former candidate who had the first claim on the nomination in 1956. I saw him in May in Chicago and told him that he ought to make an announcement that he was going to be the candidate and there would be no opposition in the convention in 1956. This was in 1955. Then I saw him again in, in uh, July 1955, uh, and he still refused to make an announcement. So the thing went on until very close up to the time of the convention, and he did announce that he was going to be a candidate. And I had been told by some of his close friends that uh, in 1952 he considered that I had been lassoed to him, that I had been, in fact, a drag on the... Democratic Party, and I felt that some means ought to be found so that uh, that drag would not continue. And when I got to Chicago as a visitor to the convention, I was not a delegate, I uh, made the statement that uh, I hoped that the convention would find a candidate that could be elected. I didn't think that Mr. Stevenson could be elected, and that I was taking myself out of the picture. I didn't have any ambitions. But I wanted to help elect the nominee of the Democratic Convention. Well, the man I wanted to support was Abel Harriman, the governor of New York. He was a very able man, one of the best that's ever been in public life. But the time came around for the nomination, and uh, Mr. Stevenson was overwhelmingly nominated. And as a good Democrat who believes that his opinion should be expressed, publicly in a convention when the party has a meeting, but after the convention has acted that he should go along with the people he's been associated with and who have done him the greatest honor as is possible. I supported the nominee with everything I had. I made trips all over the country at the request of the National Democratic Committee 
did everything I could to get the nominee elected. Well, we had the same result as we did in 1952, although the result was not nearly as bad as it was in 1952 for the simple reason that for the first time in 148 years, a president was elected without his Congress. The Democrats elected the Congress, which goes to show that the majority of the people in the United States are still Democrats, and that the Democratic Party is the majority party. And I'm hoping to live long enough to see the situation remedied by a Democratic president and a Democratic Congress in 1960. Well, you wanted a winner in 1956. Very much. Everyone always does. I wanted a winner. Very much. You thought Harriman had a better chance than Stevens. That's my thought, but I may. I, I, I still think so, but I may have been mistaken. I, I've come to the conclusion after this immense majority that uh, grammar and patient popularity are hard to overcome, which is proven conclusively by maids when they come to the queens and slept in a little single bed there and enjoyed herself very much. She had a grand time at the White House and told a lot of people where to get off. <laughs> I'm very glad I, I, I brought her there because she died a short time after this. Mr. President, uh, how would you describe the Democratic Party of the Well, uh, when Roosevelt took office uh, in 1933, in his uh, inaugural speech, he outlined a program which after it became the New Deal, that is, a reorganization of uh, things so that the everyday man and the small homeowner and the small businessman would have as much chance to prosper as the special interest people who had been in control of the government. The Fair Deal was a continuation of that idea, try to keep the government in the hands of uh, the people. As Jefferson said, they are to be trusted, and I think they are. And uh, I tried my best to arrange things so that uh, the country's prosperity, everybody would profit by it. A small family of a family. Would you think that the phrase, uh, give him hell, Harry, helped you considerably in 1948? I don't know whether it did or not. I don't know who originated that, but uh, I always told them when they would uh, say that to me in a crowd that I never did give anybody hell. I just told the truth to them and they thought it was hell. I had a conversation last night with a candidate for a uh, sheriff in Florida, and he told me that there was a Policeman running against him and had made a couple of You were talking a little bit earlier about uh, advisors and colleagues and so forth, and, and I forgot to mention the name of uh, Mr. Henry L. Stimson. I uh, thought very highly of uh, uh, Mr. Stimson. He'd been Secretary of State in Hoover's cabinet when the Japanese went into Manchuria, and he'd made, made a recommendation that they be stopped, which might have prevented the Third World War if they had been stopped. Of course, that's another case of hindsight. I don't like to talk about hindsight, but he became Secretary of War in President Roosevelt's cabinet, and of course, when I took over, he was still Secretary of War. And I had been acquainted with him in my investigating very much. If you would uh, call off your dogs and not have the investigation, I said, Mr. Secretary, if you tell me that, I know it's true, and I'll call him off, and I did. That's right, and he was also present when that atomic bomb was exploded in, in New Mexico, in Potsdam, uh, in Potsdam. And when the message came, I called in Secretary Stimson and Admiral Levy and one or two others, General Marshall, General Eisenhower, and asked them where the best place would be the music, that if we did have to use it, which I was afraid we would have to do, uh, it should be done on uh, cities that were devoted entirely to war work in Japan. And Secretary Stimson and his staff worked out the recommendations on the points on which that bomb should be dropped, and they were followed to the letter. Okay. I think you're right. Uh, finally, though, I
uh, uh, proposition to negotiate about it, um, what you think you're right. And you have to have a uh, uh, frame of mind of give and take. You know anybody, you can't get everything you want. Okay, two cameras on this one. Uh, I wonder if you'd like to give your impressions of some of the people you have had to deal with. I wonder if you'd like to give your impression on some of the people you've had to deal with. Uh, let's start with Stalin. Stalin. Go. The guy was one of the hardest men I ever had to deal with, and uh, uh, it was not uh, due to anything else except the personality of the go, I think. Churchill? Churchill. Well, so in there, I think, ten, ten, ten. Uh, yeah. Nero was, I uh, think, a very difficult person now, and I only had one meeting with him, uh, and when he came to visit me at the White House to discuss the Marshall Plan for India. I uh, think he's... Uh, I know connection with Chiang Kai-shek. I never met him, only through General Marshall. General Marshall's characterization of him was that he was a very difficult man to be with. You presided over a great revolution of events. Uh, was this a deliberate plan, or were you compelled to do this? Mr. President, you presided over what I think could be called a great revolution by consent in this country, to the point where our connections now step out. But we were forced into it by events as they came about. Uh, we completely reversed our policy of isolationism to one of internationalism, and that was absolutely unnecessary if we became the leader in the free world, which we did. But you were considerably helped uh, in that by Senator Arthur Vandenberg, weren't you? Senator Arthur Vandenberg himself, a great isolationist, was converted to the fact that it was necessary for us to take the world viewpoint, and there was an honest conviction on his part. There were great many other men in this country. It had to be here, we couldn't have done it. Uh, don't you consider that Molotov made one of his great mistakes regarding the Marshall Plan of the Don't you consider that Molotov made one of his major mistakes at the meeting in Paris? If he had stayed there and asked for great sums of money under the Marshall Plan for Russia for the satellite countries, that Congress then perhaps would not have appropriated for it. That's entirely possible, although immediately after the World War II was, World War II was over, the Congress and the President were in a friend of mind to help Russia in every way to recover. And we offered that help, but they wouldn't take it. Now, in 1957, do you see any chance of agreement with the Russians? Well, now, as of 1957, do you see any real chance of agreement or accommodation with the Russians? I hope there is a chance for agreement with the Russians, but I'll say this. Unless we have the strength behind it to enforce any agreements we make, they're no good. Uh, what about the Russian warrior? Do you feel that gradually the tendency of the satellites to break away will increase and grow? I certainly do. Uh, these uh, satellites, you must remember, have been uh, shoved around from the time of the, the history of Europe began. Poland and Czechoslovakia and Bulgaria and Romania and uh, Yugoslavia have all been kicked around by the Turks and the Tatars and the, by, uh, uh, the great powers of Western Europe when they were at the height of their power, and always says, remembered that sometime or other they'd be free, they will not. But once they knew freedom and they will seek it again, that's right? true. Well, a, a freedom loving people, I don't know. Uh, in the long run, do you see any possibility of our recognizing West China? In the long run, do you see any possibility of our recognizing West China? I'm not in a position at the present time to make a definite statement on the subject. The uh, policy that was pursued with regard to Russia is the only example that I have to uh, look to, and I'm not well enough informed to give you an intelligence. Uh, have you had any concern over our, our country having overextended itself in the global commitment? Have you any concern, Mr. President, lest uh, we have overextended ourselves, that we have made commitments beyond our capabilities in all these agreements for defense around the world? No, I don't think we've overextended ourselves at all. The only difficulty that we're faced with is to be sure that our friends remain our friends in case they do not then they're overextended. Uh, how do you feel about the future of NATO? Uh, well, you had a large hand in creating NATO. What do you feel about its future? 
I think the future leader depends entirely on uh, our assumption of leadership in the free world and maintaining our friendship with the people who've always been our friends. That's what made NATO possible. Uh, this is moving up a third day question, but it's good job here. Uh, can you appoint uh, General Eisenhower to the NATO job? And you appointed General Eisenhower to that key job? Yes, I thought he was the best qualified man for the job, and I still think so. Uh, is it possible, in your opinion, that uh, historically uh, we have suffered from a dual personality on the yeah. Mr. President, you might agree that historically we have suffered from a sort of split personality on the subject of colonialism. On the one hand, wanting to support our traditional allies, on the other hand, wanting to support those people who want to be free anywhere in the world. Well, uh, that uh, situation has uh, been developing for a long time. Uh, in President Roosevelt's administration, he made it perfectly clear to Britain and Holland and France that the end of colonialism was in sight, and he brought it out. Uh, you didn't uh, exactly follow President Roosevelt's policy. How's the Truman Library coming? It's nearing completion. I have an idea that we'll be ready to move into it on May the 8th, 1957. Do you think it's appropriate for a former president of the United States to go about raising money personally in order to provide a place to house official papers? No, I do not. But it's the only way it can be done under present circumstances. The president then spoke about uh, the problems of being the next president and uh, you said the proposal now is for 25,000 out of the And the proposal now is that former president should get the munificent sum of $25,000 a year on which they'll have to pay taxes. That is uh, correct. Of course, it's uh, much better than nothing. The thing that is most important is that they'll furnish some help. The government will furnish some help to the, pre to the, uh, the former presidents and uh, uh, give them an office, which is most important. Uh, you say in your book that some of this material cannot be released for centuries. Well, so you say in your book that some of this material cannot be released for many years, perhaps for centuries. What kind of material would that be? Well, it's material that uh, would reflect on living people and embarrass families unnecessarily. There are still a great many documents in the archives building uh, relating to the Civil War, which have never been released for that very same reason. Uh, so they will be available to serious students. So they will be available to serious students and scholars. That's correct. They will be available for those who are interested in facts for historical purposes, but not for the idea of uh, writing columns or, or reflecting on somebody for a headline. Uh, I assume that uh, you consider that you came the national prominence to the Truman Committee. What were the achievements of this committee? Well, sir, uh, I assume it would be true to say that you achieved national prominence major accomplishment was to discover things that were not going well and that were likely to go wrong or grafters or things of that kind so that there would not have to be 116 investigating committees after the war was over and there were not. Do you have a feeling, President, that the power of some of these investigating committees is sometimes stretched too far? Mr. President, do you have the feeling that sometimes the ability of Congress to investigate is stretched too far, is abused? Yes, I think it is abused in a lot of instances, and there's no necessity for it. The objective of an investigation is to get information for the purpose of writing legislation. Uh, sometimes the objective of the chairman of some committees is to make headlines for himself. He's not interested in legislation. During your years in the Senate, what was the most difficult vote you had? Well, sir, during your years, well, sir, uh, during your years in the Senate, what was the most difficult vote you had to cast? I think it was in regard to the Supreme Court. 
I stayed to the end on that subject, and uh, I think it was right, and I still think it's right. You say in your book that about 30 senators work hard and do most of the work in the West Coast. Mr. President, you say in your book that about 30 or 40 senators work very hard indeed, that another 10 or 15 work medium hard, and the rest just coast. Is that still true in your view? Well, as far as I know, I can only speak uh, from experience. My 10 years in the Senate, that was substantially true. Uh, more than any other previous president, you had control of the budget and explaining it to the press and public. Do you have a feeling that the budget director operates in too much of a match? Well, more than any other president, you, you had command of the national budget and certainly could explain it better. But do you have the feeling that the budget director operates too much in a vacuum? No, that isn't true. The budget director is one of the arms of the executive department. That is, he's a direct arm of the president of the United States who is responsible for making the budget. My experience with the budget had been due to the fact that I had been on the Appropriations Committee in the Senate for 10 years, and during my uh, official position as President of the United States, I made eight budgets. Now, you have a figure in them, and the budget director is absolutely essential to the President, and he's a career man and one of the most conscientious men in government. What do you regard as the ideal relationship between the President and the Cabinet? What do you regard as the ideal relationship between the President and his Cabinet? The uh, Cabinet and the President must be absolutely frank with each other. Uh, cabinet members must have the ability and the nerve to tell the president what they think he ought to hear and not what he wants to hear. But when a, the decision is made by the president, a uh, cabinet member must go along. If he doesn't, he ought to get out of the cabinet. I know you feel that the vice president should be informed on all matters. I know you feel that the vice president should be informed on all matters of state. There's any question about that when... Uh, uh, Senator Barclay was Vice President of the United States. He was in on every detail of every action that the President intended to take. This last one is a declarator, uh, and the final authority has to be given. And the final authority must necessarily be the President. There's no question about that. He's the Chief Executive of the United States, and his actions are his own. He wants all the advice he can get, but when he acts, that's it. You want to get your upper lip there? No. Uh, in the creation of the National Security uh, Council uh, was to create a better clearinghouse for information. Wasn't quite the way the sentence went. And the creation of the National Security Council was designed to bring everything more into one fist, wasn't it? It is intended to uh, coordinate and uh, place all the messages that come to the executive department of the government uh, in a position where the president could understand the whole picture without having to go through thousands of messages, some of which were duplicates of others. You see, there are four or five departments of the government that have foreign uh, connections, and every one of those messages had to be so coordinated that it would make sense to the president. It is absolutely essential, and there was no way in the world for the president to know the facts unless he could know what those messages contain. Do you think that the CIA and Central Intelligence Agency should be subjected to more investigation by Congress? Mr. President, do you think uh, the Central Intelligence Agency should be subject to closer scrutiny by Congress? I don't see any necessity for uh, uh, exceedingly close scrutiny. Every department ought to be uh, uh, open to scrutiny by Congress whenever they feel it's necessary on account of their appropriation. But the Central Intelligence Agency is an intelligence set up for the welfare and benefit of the president, and it's his agency. But the Congress, of course, would have to appropriate the money for it. They have a right to find out what the money's for. But they ought to go too far with it. Uh, Mr. President, do you uh, remember your first 48 hours in office? Mr. President, um, I'm sure you remember very vividly your first 48 hours in office. I shall never forget it. The most impressive. 48 hours I ever had in my life or ever will have. Of course, I'll never forget that. It made a very great impression on me. Uh, you say in your book that uh, you escaped the guards on the way to the White House. Uh, you say in your book that uh, when you were on your way to the White House to be informed of Mr. Roosevelt's death, that you escaped your guards for the first time, and you seemed rather pleased about it. Why was that? Well, it happened by accident. I was in the office of the Speaker of the House of Representatives when the message came from Steve Early for me to come to the White House. And I went out through the ground floor of the Capitol building, crossed the street, and my 
uh, vice presidential driver happened to be at the wheel of the car, and I got in and went to White House as fast as I could, and the Secret Service men who had been assigned to the vice president were waiting at the proper place for me to come out. I didn't come out there. Ed, uh, the president talked about the job of the Secret Service men and so forth, and we need an interpretive word, and just says that's the Treasury Department. Oh, that's the Treasury Department, of course. The Secret Service uh, is a part of the Treasury Department. They have two duties, one to protect the president and one to catch counterfeiters, and they're very efficient in both cases. Uh, exactly what did you feel when you were told that you were president of the United States? Well, of course, it was a great shot. Oh, boy. <laughs> Ten cents in the bowl. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. I the bowl. Oh, that's you. <laughs> exactly, exactly what did you feel when you were told that you were president? Well, it was a tremendous shock. And it would be a shock to anybody to be suddenly told that he was the chief executive of the greatest nation in the world. And I was tremendously shocked, and it took some time to get over it. But I immediately stepped in and called a meeting of the cabinet and went to work. Uh, in a period of three months, and then you enumerated the thing and ended up with nobody in history, mm -hmm. ever wrote it. Mm -hmm. Well, Mr. President, in a period of three months, you became president, the war in Europe ended, Japan surrendered, the nuclear age began, the United Nations was created. No man in history ever rode such a tiger in such a short time. How did you manage it? How did you keep your equilibrium? How did you sleep at night? Well, I, no trouble sleeping at night. I uh, took things as they came, one at a time, made the decision and went on from there. If the decision turned out to be wrong, I changed it. No man can make correct decisions all the time, but in a case of that kind, Decisions have to be made, and I'm happy to say most of them were right, I think. Did religion help? Did religion help to sustain you? Certainly did. Certainly did. I come from a religious family, and we believe that the efficacy of prayer. Uh, the president ended up speaking about the Sermon on the Mount, and, and then you led into the recognition of the state of Israel um, within hours or so. 